hi, hello, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Jess and obviously you can tell that today I'm talking about Dune. Dune. <laughs> so, <laughs> I originally was going to just do a non-spoiler part and then a spoilery part and then I was writing out my thoughts and uh, the non-spoiler part turned out to be pretty long. So this video is just going to be non-spoilery at the end there's like a little bit of spoiler but it's like not really a spoiler but i'm gonna mark it as a spoiler just in case you don't like to have like anything ruined for you in the story but have a lot of thoughts i have a lot of complicated feelings about this book obviously everybody and their mama is reading this book right now because the adaptation is coming out tomorrow i believe once you watch this video and I also want to watch the adaptation and that's why I read it. I'm very proud of myself. I feel very accomplished that I finished Dune. I did a hybrid read. At first I started reading the physical copy and then it was a, a struggle. <laughs> so a lot of people recommended the audio and I had a really nice person, a nice bookstagram friend send me the audio. So I listened to the audio but also followed along with the physical book. And I have thoughts. Before filming this video, I watched a few videos on YouTube. I will be honest, there's not a lot. You either find a few rants, really not that many, or you find everyone who loves it and thinks it's the greatest book ever written. And so I was like, mm, that's not helpful. I read some reviews and Goodreads. I also listened to um, a podcast called Fire the Cannon Pod, and they did a whole recap on the entire book. So if you don't want to read the book, you should listen to the episode. I'll link it down below. So like I said, everyone and their mama is trying to read this book before the adaptation because that's what we bookworms do. It makes sense. I didn't hate it. I didn't love it. I have a lot of thoughts. And so I'm going to share them with you. And maybe if you have not read Dune and you're thinking about it, I hope this video can help you decide if you want to read it or not. And yeah, that's all I got to say. So let's get into it. <laughs> I'm going to put this down. So I have written notes. So if you see me look at looking at the screen just because I don't want to forget things and even writing notes, I probably forgot things because there's a lot in this book. This edition is 617 pages without the appendices. But I think the appendices are about 70 or 80 pages. So and the print it is it's not big. So it is a lot of book. I think the mass market paperback maybe closer to 800 pages. And uh, there's a lot that goes on in here. So I know I probably won't get to, to everything. All my thoughts or some of my thoughts are spoilery. And you know, maybe I will do a spoiler field video depending on how I feel but I'm gonna go ahead and get into this. So like I said, everyone's trying to read this book ahead of the adaptation. And it's very interesting because it's not just sci science fiction and fantasy readers. There are a lot of people from who primarily read young adult fantasy or romance who I've seen also trying to read the book, which is fine. I just don't know if you don't predominantly read SFF, adult SFF, if this really is gonna be the book for you. And I never want to be like some kind of gatekeeper or something, but honestly, after reading it, and I read a fair amount of adult science fiction fantasy, if you're not typically an adult SFF reader, I don't know if this book is, would be a great book for you, especially not like your first foray into these genres, like definitely not the first one to jump into. Who knows, like you could read it and love it, but I wouldn't like personally recommend someone to start here. It's a very slow burn story, kind of throws you into the world and you learn about the world, the people, technology, all the terms, like as you go. So it's definitely not something that sets up a bunch of world building and then you get into the story, which is good or bad, depending on what kind of story you like. But at, at the beginning, especially like the first couple hundred pages, I was like, what? what is going on? Like, I'm so confused. So then for my fellow science fiction fantasy readers, especially adult SFF readers who may be considering reading doing what I recommend it, honestly, I'm gonna say no. And I know, hear me out. I know there's super Dune fans, not trying to shit on your fave, but just hear me out. We have so much available to us now in, in SFF. Like, so much obviously there's middle grade young adult adult and even in adult now there's just so much more than what was available in the 1960s so of course this book was super popular i don't think it started off super popular i think it got more popular with time but now in the year of our lord 2021 we have a lot of options and since this book is from 1965 obviously it has been the inspiration for a lot of work that has come after it like the wheel of time and uh, game of thrones so you've probably read a lot of things that have been influenced by dune so i don't know that reading dune is necessarily a must like if you want to read classic science fiction and 
you know, you're into the premise, sure, but I'm just saying like, you don't feel like you have to read it. Um, if you're interested, do it, but you're still a sci-fi fantasy fan. You're still a lover of the genre if you do not read this book. I really hate that idea that if you haven't read Lord of the Rings, you can't love fantasy. If you haven't read Dune, if you haven't read Isaac Asimov, you can't love science fiction. And like, uh -huh, please miss me with that bullshit. So just if you were wondering like, oh, I really need to read the classics that like you don't, if you want to do it, but do not feel like you have to. And you're like, well, Jessica, um, if you were following along when I posted on Instagram or on Twitter, sometimes I was struggling through this book and you're like, well, you read it. You felt like you had to read it. I had an interest in Dune. I tried to read it a couple years ago, wasn't feeling it, put it off and then picked it up again because I have heard it's a classic. I am interested because I have not read that many classic uh, science fiction or fantasy books. And then uh, the premise or how people talked about it really made me interested in it. And so once I started reading it and I know there's such a big Dune culture, I was like, well, I don't want to, I can't criticize this book off of the only 100 pages I read. I wanted to read the whole thing. I really took the Leanna approach and I was like, I'm starting this book. I'm going to finish it so I can say, no, I read it. Here's what I liked. Here's what I didn't like. And it was not a terrible experience. Overall, I gave it three stars, uh, which isn't the best, but it isn't the worst. So you're not missing out, I don't think, if you don't read this book. I know there's probably people who are going to disagree with me, but if you have been an avid reader and you've read a lot of science fiction and fantasy, this isn't going to offer you something revolutionary and new. And I'm not saying that it copies things. Obviously things copied it. So it just is that no, you don't need to read it. But if you want to, sure. But I will put respect on his name. Obviously, Frank Herbert Dune is the reason we have so many of the great things we have now. Like I said, 1965, I did Google and I was looking up books that came out in the 1960s. And there were other science fiction books that came out. And I was reading articles and really trying to figure out why Dune specifically was such a was the one that people are like, this is the foundation of our genre. And I really couldn't find a concise answer. Some people were like, because of the uh, complex world building and how much research and everything went into it, which is valid. But there are other people writing like Ursula K. Le Guin was writing in this era. And there are other really foundational texts that came out in the 60s. So I'm assuming because it was a white dude is probably why it's the most important one. Like no tea, no shade. I mean, this is 1960s. I don't know if you know the the reason the exact reason I don't know if there is an exact reason or if you have an opinion on why this is the foundational one if there were other science fiction books that came out at the time and obviously they weren't all the same they were very different this one is uh has a lot of themes in it that maybe the other ones didn't so maybe that's why it's such an important important one to the genre but you know whatever so for a long time I've heard of Dune but didn't realize it was a series I thought it was just the first book there are six books actually in the series, but I'm pretty sure Dune is the longest one. When I looked at Dune Messiah, which is the second book, I think it's barely 300 pages. So I found that really interesting because normally books start out and they usually get longer and not shorter and definitely not shorter by that much. And then there's also even more books past that, but they're written by like uh, Frank Herbert's son and someone else. And apparently there's dozens of those. Um, but I feel like if you're talking about the Dune series specifically, I think people really just refer to the first six. So the book itself takes place on this planet Arrakis, but for the sake of this video, I'm just going to refer to it as Dune. And it's called Dune because it's a desert planet and there's lots of sand dunes. And fun fact, when I was looking things up about this book, I guess Frank Herbert, he was living in around the Washington, Oregon area. He was inspired by like some sand dunes that are in Oregon. So I thought that was really interesting. And they this society has had a war now this is 20,000 or thousands of years in the future in the book and there's been a war and essentially the result of that was they don't trust like artificial intelligence they don't trust computers a quote from the book is the god of machine logic was overthrown and a new concept was raised man may not be replaced and so they have technology but it's like not computers or nothing that's artificial intelligence but other things are you know more technologically advanced of course because it is a science fiction book in this story there also are noble houses so that is a, a thing that really reminded me of game of thrones and <clears throat> they are controlled by an evil emperor so be it so of course there's political court intrigue and maneuvering uh scheming backstabbing what's new so of course dune being a desert planet is not an easy place to live uh, water is a really scarce 
resource and is really important. And there are on Dune, the people wear what they're called still suits. So basically like this little thing, I think it's like in their mouth and like a suit that takes any of their uh, water. So if they sweat or if they pee <laughs> or if they cry, it would take that water and recycle it so they can drink it. And I'm like, eco-friendly, great. Gross, yes. I think, I don't know if he said in the book, but I think they smell. They don't smell great. And I wouldn't be surprised. So anyway, the basis of the story, like I said, we have the noble houses. Our main character is Paul Atreides. And so he's of House Atreides. And one of the other big houses is House Harkonnen. And of course, they're enemies. And so House Atreides, they don't live on Dune originally. They live on this planet that has water and is green and whatever. And they end up going to Dune. And of course, chaos ensues. Of course, there's scheming and plans and trapping people and plotting against people and all the things that come with like political intrigue stories is there but on a planet in space. Also on Dune there is a natural resource called spice and uh, it's very important and people of course are going to what fight over this resource. So just a lot of things you probably have seen in other stories or also in real life. There's also the Bene Gesserit which are they're basically witches they're all women and for generations and generations and generations they have basically had this breeding program or I mean eugenics to try to breed this one person which I cannot pronounce it's called like the Qui Six Hatterack probably saying that wrong that's going to be a man even though their whole organization is women but they're trying to breed to make a man okay and uh they have like psychic abilities among other powers and one of them her name is lady jessica she is the mother of Paul, our main character. And then Paul's father is Duke Leto. Obviously, he's of House Atreides. They're, you know, royal fancy people. And so schemes, death, betrayal, dehydration, battle, giant worms, mess ensues. I know that sounds interesting. And it is in places, but there are some things that may uh, make people would enjoy it less that made me enjoy it less. So the first one, like I said earlier, is you're just kind of thrown in and it depends on what kind of reader you are. Normally, I don't mind world building. Sometimes it becomes a bit much. But this one was kind of a lot to get going. And yes, in the back, if you have a physical copy, there are the appendices with the ecology of doom, the religion of doom, the characters of doom, but it gets annoying to keep flipping back and forth. And obviously, if you have an audio version or a Kindle version, that would be really obnoxious to try to go back and forth to the glossary. So after a while, or the appendices, after a while, I was like, all right, whatever. I'm just going to go with it and figure it out based on, you know, the the context. And that eventually worked. But it is kind of you're just like, hey, we're doing it. We're on Dune. Here are all these words. Let's do it. And I'm like, Frank, could you ease me in? But he said no. The pacing for me, I think the pacing of this book was a big thing that lowered my enjoyment. It took me a little while to get into, I would say like the first 100 pages, then something happens and I'm like, okay, I'm into it. And then I'm like into it, things are happening and then it like slows down and things are happening and then it like slows down. So the pacing was very inconsistent and not like a book has to be like, go, 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 go. But I think it was too long. And some parts were just really drawn out and like a lot of descriptions and a lot and like, all right, Frank, all right, my dude, we get it. So for me, um, I know a lot of people really like the beginning, really like the ending, the middle is kind of slog city. And for me, I just had moments. So I guess it depends on what you're really into in, in the story. But I had moments of like really great highs and then like lows where I would like fall asleep and I'd have to go back because I fell asleep and <laughs> re-listen to it. Sorry if the sun just changed, just ignore it. So that's an issue. Also the writing, it obviously is written in 1965. So it is definitely not the same as most contemporary writers. That I think that's where the audio really helped me because the audio is full cast. So something I love a full cast audiobook, but something I noticed with this one, uh, especially literally following along in the book is they do not read the book word for word, they say most of the words, right. But if there's a descriptor about how their voices like his voice trembled, or he said this, or she said this, that's obviously they don't say that because they just act it out in the story. It was weird, though, because sometimes there would be multiple voice actors who are different characters. And then sometimes one voice actor would be doing multiple characters. I don't know. But still, it helped me a lot. So 
reading the writing just like myself I got to page eight <laughs> and I would rewrite re mm, I would reread a sentence and be like what why is it structured this way? So I have seen some people say that the writing is very approachable. It's not um, intimidating. So it may not be intimidating for you, but it was for me. And I preferred listening to the audio and then following along. There's another issue about the style of this book that, I mean, I, I kind of got used to it, but it's not my favorite. And I love a multiple POV story if I feel like all the POVs are necessary. The thing with this one is it's not like the chapter starts out in Paul's POV and stays in Paul's POV. It jumps from people's POV, whoever's in like the scene. And sometimes you don't realize that. And I'm like, wait, 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 who was talking? Obviously the audiobook helped when people had different voices, but when it was the same voice actor, but changing their voice, sometimes it was confusing. So that could be a little odd that it just like goes from Paul to Lady Jessica to his dad, like going back and forth. I only recently I've read this in like a Nora Roberts novel. Hers did that too. And it kind of threw me off but you kind of get used to it, but just be aware that that does happen as well. So other things that uh, lowered my enjoyment of the story, I'll be kind of going back with things I liked and things I didn't like. So I really in the beginning was loving Lady Jessica. I was like, okay, we have a fantasy written in the 60s by a dude, but we've got a woman, a strong woman who's important. She has lines, she has a purpose. Not like she doesn't have a purpose, um, towards the end of the story. But I feel like she was stronger in the first half and um, was more like relied upon and her advice was, uh, Paul took her advice more and I liked Paul in the first part more. In the second half, he really was starting to get on my nerves. Honestly, he was 15, okay, I get it. But he started being a little smart ass and I'm like, look, you need to calm down, that's still your mom, you need to respect her. But he didn't, but I mean, he's a white child, so what do you expect, whoops, but I feel like it started out stronger with this role of the women, but then it started to lessen. And I guess it makes sense if this whole organization of women's whole purpose is to create a man who's going to be the savior, this like, uh, you know, foretold person. And that just bothers me. And I was like, why? And then I was like, oh yeah, Frank's a man, that's why. But like, it could have been a woman. I just didn't like that. But towards the second half, I really felt like it became more clear, like, oh yeah, <laughs> this is a man writing the story. Paul just became more annoyed with her, made her seem like she was less important, really questioned her, um, like the way he thought about her, just thinking she wasn't that intelligent and that she was dragging him down. And I was like, this is so disrespectful. So I did not like that. And especially towards the end of the book, the way Jessica was, be her characterization, especially towards other women and oh, I just didn't love that. It started out so good and then kind of went down. And um, you know, it, it is 1965. I'm gonna be saying this a lot about the time because it is a big piece of this is that it is written, it was written in 1965. That's a huge thing, especially reading a book today in 2021. There's gonna be things where you're like, mm, but it started out so strong and then kind of went down. So that was something that really, uh, that made me sad. Another thing is the villain. So we have a villain, of course, um, one of them. And he is described as he's a big man, he's fat. But it's like the way Herbert describes him every time he comes into a scene, it's just like that he is the most disgusting, sloppy, huge, thing on the planet and I'm like all right dude we get it and not only is the villain fat the villain is gay and a pedophile and so it's just like putting all those things together I feel like when you only have your villain be those things well I mean anybody who's a pedophile is disgusting but you're gonna have a gay character the only gay character be the pedophile and be fat and sloppy like I didn't love that um <laughs> I didn't love that at all. And obviously the time, whatever, maybe it doesn't bother people, but if that's something that's gonna bother you, literally I'm saying every time this man is mentioned, before we're talking about him, we're talking about how he looks. It's not great. I think those are some of the bigger things and important things to consider if you're thinking about going into this book. It is long, like I said, I think it's too long. Um, I, I feel like a lot of classic things are overwritten and obviously it was editing and publishing was way different then than it is now, but it is very long. And like I said before, it's very odd to me that this book is so long and then the sequels are short. I have heard people say that, you know, to really get at least 
uh, the story you should read Dune Messiah which is barely 300 pages so yes I've thought about reading it I don't know right now if I'm going to but that's just very interesting the structure of the series um, and so I think who Dune is for is if you are really into science fiction adult science fiction and really okay with just the concepts because there's a lot of great concepts in the story it's talking about obviously colonialism and there's religion and like ecology um a lot of those there's probably other concepts i'm forgetting right now and then so i really like that because essentially they want to make dune into this eco oasis um i don't feel like that was explained necessarily too well maybe i missed that to be fair you know but i tried to go through and like review other sources maybe i missed it but like that's a cool concept i didn't feel like it was explained super well like obviously i didn't expect to see it on page but just their plans i didn't really get but maybe i missed it maybe it's in the next book um but for me there is a plot but it moves slow and then I was never super attached to any of the characters and characters are really important to me. So maybe if characters aren't super important to you, you may really love Dune. And maybe there are people who did connect to like Paul. And I really did like Lady Jessica in the beginning, but then less. But I never really felt like worried about them. Like if I get really connected to a character, I'm like super concerned about everything that's gonna happen to them. I didn't feel that way. I just was interested to see what happened, but I wasn't like overly invested and if they lived or died and so that's why I couldn't be higher than a three star to me but obviously other people are probably going to have different feelings I don't know Paul might be like their fave ever <laughs> and how can I forget I did mention briefly but there are sandworms and honestly I love the sandworms because it always every time they were on page it made me think of the movie Tremors that I used to watch so often but the scenes they were in like were just very interesting to read like they were really fun I get with envisioning tremors i just had this really great vision in my mind it became like you know a little cinematic moment in my mind about these freaking big ass sandworms and they're very interesting they're essentially trying to uh protect spice and there's all these different ways that the people who are native to dune get around you know not being eaten by giant sandworms and yeah i really i found them a really great addition to the story so I said before, obviously there's religion, which are in a lot of fantasy books, obviously, usually sometimes a made up religion, sometimes a branch of something. I know I was reading this one piece and they were talking about how it's really kind of an amalgamation. And I think if you read the part in the back and I didn't, okay, sue me, about the uh, religion of Dune, it is kind of like Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, like a whole mashup of religions and in the story they have what's called like the orange catholic bible that's like their bible that they reference which you know whatever and um the book itself also has a lot of influence from like islam and there's a lot of arabic words names in here so i am not muslim i'm i do not practice islam so i do not have a lot of knowledge and i cannot say whether that was written well or not so i did google to see like you know if anyone had opinions on that and recently there was a piece written for tour by someone who um, is muslim and i thought it was really interesting it's really long essay i'll link it down below but i did um take some excerpts out that i'd like to read because i thought it was just different because i have seen people say that you know it's kind of orientalism orientalism wow is that the word <laughs> or like appropriation um or you know used to make the books like exotic so i'll just read some of uh his essay and he said comments and interpretations like these conflict with my experiences i find the book's engagement with islam to transcend linguistic wordplay and obscure intertextuality after all herbert was fascinated by linguistics and believed words shape substantive meaning the use of voice by the Bene Gesserit, an order of imperialist superhuman female breeders, is a prime example of this, as this is the saga's running obsession with symbols and myths. As these semiotic tools wield tremendous power within the Dune universe, Herbert's references likewise generate a profound Muslimness that goes beyond mere Orientalist aesthetics. This is not to say that Dune novels are not Orientalist in other ways, which I have detailed elsewhere. Dune does not cheaply plagiarize from Muslim histories, ideas, and practices, but actively engages with them. So I thought that was really interesting. He does talk about how 
they you know there is a lack of Muslim people involved in the new adaptation both behind the scene and on on screen and that's important in Dune obviously they're in a desert planet the the people there of course are darker they're called the Fremen um, and so there have been people who have looked at the story and really um, feel like it is kind of a parallel kind of to the Middle East and that Paul and his family coming in are really like the white saviors um, and the person who wrote this piece goes on to say that Dune's Muslimness is attractive because it is an interrogation within Islam, what Assad might call its discursive tradition, at the same time as it is a critique, however limited, of colonialism and capitalism. Dune operates in its own world. The novels perform that delightfully powerful trick of refusing to cater to ideas of Islam in popular discourse. The saga is not reactionary, but a conversation with itself about how Muslims have and will continue to interact with one another other face and their oppressors. It is that messy of truths and uncertain realm like the other memories of the Quis the Quisix Hadarak, wow I cannot say it, or Abu Suleiman's muddy courtyard which makes Dune's Muslimness so enticing to readers like this. For me reading the books is an eerily, an eerily familiar experience of encountering a work which has absorbed and pieced together elements of my upbringing and community conversations and reframed them in an exciting strange and different ways. Sometimes reading Dune feels as if I'm listening to an offbeat uncle in the, in the late hours after a community gathering. He sips his tea and asks, eyes wild, hands whipping through the multiverse that is Muslim history. What if Muslims were around 20,000 years from now, in space? And what if colonialism was still a thing? What would be different? What would stay the same? Imagine this. And so, like I said, it'll be linked down below. It's a really long essay, but I just thought that was an interesting take because I have heard negative things. And obviously this is only one person's view of the book and it's Islam, Islamic influence, but I still thought that was um, a unique perspective. And so this is the last part where I feel like it gets kind of spoilery. And it, I mean, it's not like a super big spoiler, but if you ever heard about Dune, if you're gonna watch the movie, like you've heard conversations around Dune, you probably already know this, but just in case, I'm going to talk about spoilers and now so Paul obviously is white <laughs> he's a white person from his healthy planet and he's going to a desert planet where the people are darker so you know they're called the Fremen and Paul is the queen six Hatterack whatever you want to call it the foretold prophet dude whatever that has come to lead the Fremen and <laughs> sounds like colonialism and I hear people that criticize the book because they say it's a white Oh, I was about to, wow. I was about to say a white slave narrative. No, <laughs> no, a white savior narrative. And I will say that it, I don't know, it's very complicated. And I know, again, people said it's important to read Dune Messiah to fully understand this. Paul, at least what I got from it is that he doesn't want to be this foretold person. He can see into the future and he knows all these bad things are going to happen essentially because of like the Bene Gesserit and their whole plan to create this Quisid Hatterach who he is and he knows it's going to lead to a lot of death and destruction and he doesn't want to do it. He's, he's very reluctant. He knows um that he has I think in the book they call it his terrible purpose but he also knows that it's inevitable and it's something that he has to do in order to get you know for the long goal so at least he's not like hey I'm white Paul and I'm gonna save the brown people he's not like that um he doesn't want to be and he knows that how it looks and how things are gonna happen and it's not gonna be good I don't know I still don't fully like I will say I did get that part like he's definitely not like ooh, yay I'm gonna go save the day he's like damn I am this thing that they created that they wanted and I'm going to do bad shit because of what y'all did so I I don't know maybe I do need to read Dune Messiah so I can get a better understanding um because I don't think it's I think it's easy to miss I don't think it's as clear as it should be in the first book so I don't know but that's the end of spoilers so that was a lot um I tried to keep it vague to you know characters themes pacing things like that to help you decide so I hope that um you now have a better idea if you want to tackle this thick tome or not and let me know down below if you haven't read Dune do you want to read it now or you are firmly not going to read it and just watch the adaptation 
which is perfectly fine or if you're not gonna watch the adaptation at all I just would love to know your thoughts down below please keep it cute keep it respectful now I know people love Dune I didn't shit on Dune okay it was not the worst thing I read I have fun in some moments you know, I like the concepts. I can see if you read it a long time ago why you have nostalgia, but there are things where I'm like, mm -hmm. but I won't, you know, ever, I'm not going to just diminish its influence and importance. But would I, would me, would myself say that Dune is the greatest science fiction book or greatest book I've ever read? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh-uh, no, definitely not. But obviously that's my opinion. Reading is subjective. We all have our own opinions, experiences. It's obviously nothing new to me because I read it after things that influ that were influenced by Dune. And then obviously the things I talked about that uh, lower my enjoyment of it. But I'm glad that so many people love it. I may consider reading Dune Messiah. I'm not sure. I'm definitely going to watch the adaptations, may make videos on that. I don't know, but I didn't. I fucking did it. I read Dune. I read I did it. So while I can't understand why y'all are obsessed, I really can't. Um, I love that for you. You know, we all have our thing. Love it for you. I, here's, now this may get a little controversial here and maybe I'm gonna edit this out. Obviously, things like Lord of the Rings really shaped fantasy. This book shaped science fiction and fantasy but when people are like if frank herbert never wrote this book we wouldn't have such and such how do you know that if he hadn't wrote this book or this book wasn't published maybe somebody else's book would have been published and could have had similar themes with a different story and we could have had the same stories or maybe different stories or maybe more stories like I just hate that like if this had never come we would never have this you don't know that because if his book didn't get published there's probably somebody else who was also writing and their story didn't get published so in this alternate universe maybe their book got published and we get a different we have a different landscape of science fiction and fantasy today hmm, how about that maybe that made no sense i don't know my mouth is dry i've been talking for 36 minutes so that is it i hope you enjoyed this video uh, <laughs> Anything I said will be linked down below in the description. A big thank you to my patrons, Babies Besties, Kayla, Jamie, Rayner, Danielle, Katie, Bobby, Jen, Kristen, Leo, Kate, Terry, Emily, Jesse, Janine, Sarah, Pepper, Shannon, Kirsten, Elizaveta, Amber, Celine, Heidi, Maria, and Serena. And to my Nigel LaFontre stands, Brianna, Katrina, Maya, Rosie, Ava, Claire, Carrie, Tiro, Demery, Rainey. Thank you so much also to Babies Admirers and Friends of Bebe. Thank you to everyone who watches and supports the channel so give this video a thumbs up think about subscribing remember to keep it cute in the comments keep it cute in the comments stay blessed hydrated moisturized and sunscreen and i'll see you in my next one bye